Welcome to the uh, digital worship of First Presbyterian Church here in Shelbyville, Kentucky. We're glad you are with us and hope that you find some, something to take away from this service. Let us pray. Almighty God, through the power of your Holy Spirit, you enable us to do and be more than we can think or imagine. Come now, dwell within us, and make us strong to do your work and will. Through Christ Jesus, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Our first scripture for the, for the day comes from the Psalms. Psalm 137. We'll be reading the first part of that psalm, starting with verse 1. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat down, and there we wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows, there we hung up our harps, for there our captors ask of us songs, and our tormentors ask for amusement, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither. Let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. And also, let us here a reading from Ezra, starting with chapter 1, verse 1. Listen for the word of God again. In the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, in order that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished, the Lord stirred up the spirit of King Cyrus in Persia so that he sent a herald throughout all his kingdom. And also, in a written edict, declared. Thus says King Cyrus of Persia, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem in Judah. Any of those among you who are of his people, may their God be with them, are now permitted to go up to Jerusalem in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. And let all survivors in whatever place they reside be assisted by the people of their place with silver and gold, with goods and with animals, besides the free will offerings for the house of God in Jerusalem. Then the heads of the families of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites, everyone whose spirit God had stirred, got ready to go up and rebuild the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. And all their neighbors aided them with silver vessels, with gold, with goods, with animals, and with valuable gifts. Besides all that was freely offered. This is the word of the Lord. And thanks be to God for it. Hi there. Yeah, I'm modeling some of the new items you'll see in worship when we go back to worshiping in person. We'll, uh, of course, have masks. This one was made by my wife uh, after being uh, designed by my children. Uh, I have gloves on. Uh, some of you may choose choose to wear gloves. Um, I choose to do that when I go to the store. Not so sure that I'll do it here. Uh, but you may choose to do gloves. And if you don't do gloves, or even if you do, hand sanitizer. 
We may have into you may bring your own individual ones, or we'll try to have hand, hand sanitizer around the sanctuary. All of these things, all of these things, so that we can come out of our exile and be together as a people again in person. Technology is nice, but not really what we really look forward to. Now we're doing it. We have to do those new changes because, well, we want everybody to be safe. We don't want to pass this virus around. Uh, not only does it endanger lives, but it, the more infections you have, the more chance the virus has to mutate and becomes something worse. This is not about us, ourselves. It's about everybody else, helping everybody else so we can come back from our exile. And that's how I'm tying this in to the scripture. The, uh, the Hebrews from Judah and Benjamin, those two tribes, which were the only ones left after the Assyrians hauled away the rest of Israel um, and they're into parts unknown. Um, Benjamin and Judah were taken from their land by the Babylonians um, and taken back to Babylon. Babylon was a very foreign place to them. You had the arid, dry, rocky, dirty, dusty Jerusalem and that area of Palestine. And now they're in a humid, lush, uh, water-filled canals, lots of growth, lots of flourishing everything in the city of Babylon. Very different. Very, very different. And the gods that those Babylonians worshipped were not the one god that Israel worshipped. And that put them at odds. So worship was hard if, po if it was even possible. And worshiping together was difficult. It had to be done in secret in some, in some ways. It could get you killed. It depend on whatever the king's mood was or the laws of the day or how public you were. Now we've, we've known our exile for three and a half months. Three and a half months. The last time we worshiped was March the 8th. And we were hoping it would be really quickly that we'd get back, but it's turning out, no, it's not going to be quick. But three and a half months is nothing when you look at what those Jews in Babylon had to wait through. Theirs was 47, 48 years. Many of them, if not most of them, had died before they ever got back. They never saw Jerusalem, their home again. Many of them never saw it to begin with, but were born in Babylon. And leaving Babylon would be like leaving home and being exiled out in Judah. So this idea of going back to Ju the Judean landscape and leaving her home to do it, well, that did not go well with a lot of them. Fact is, only a few went back to Jerusalem. But those few were faithful, and the ones that were left behind, well, guess what? They were faithful too. And God worked with them as well as the ones who went back to Judah. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, after the initial shock of seeing it had been leveled and nobody had bothered to start rebuilding, the, those few um, Hebrews that were left in the area, they weren't rebuilding the city. They were just trying to scrap out a living. So when the folks returned, there was 
you know, this shock and horror of hopes of what they had seen when they left, but it wasn't there. They rolled up their sleeves and they got to work and they rebuilt. God never left them. That's the thing to remember. You see, if there's anything that, that the whole exile in Babylon teaches us, it's that things change. There's no going back. You, you couldn't make Solomon's temple again. You had to make do with what you had. It wasn't until King Herod came along toward the uh, first century, the latter part of the first century BC, that the temple gets built again. They're going back in 539 BC. That's an awful long time to go without that magnificent temple. So, things change. People change. The folks that would stay behind did not have the same faith that the ones that had come back from Babylon. The ones who came back from Babylon had a very centralized understanding of what the Torah meant. And it was very strong influence on what Judaism would be in, from that point on. Um, those folks, they put a lot of faith in God just leaving Babylon. And they had to put even more once they got there. God did not leave them. God did not have God's chosen people disappear. Now, a lot of people are worried about what happens if we don't get back to church, back to worship. We need to get back to worship or we're not going to have a church to worship in. And that's a reasonable fear. I mean, people get out of the habit. They may not come back. They're afraid. They don't want to ever come back because they're never going to be, they don't want to risk it. They are in a high-risk area, and they just don't want to do it. Yeah, there, there's, there's good reason to fear for that. But that's forgetting that God, God was with the Hebrews in Babylon, just as God was with the Hebrews who were taken from Jerusalem when Rome leveled it, just as God was with the Christians when in 298 to 305, there was an empire-wide edict to kill Christians. And they worshiped in crypts with rotting bodies. They were just laying there in shelves. But they worshiped anyway. They found a way. The idea that Judaism is still strong in a world when in the mid-20th century, a madman and his government tried to annihilate them all. And they're not the only ones who've tried to annihilate the Jews. There are a lot of people, including Christians. God has never left them. God has not left us. So we've been gone for three and a half months. The session hopes to open for in-person worship on August the 2nd, but we are also seeing um, increases in cases of COVID-19. I don't know. We may decide it's too risky. We'll still do these recordings. It won't be as good as being together in, in worship and sanctuary but we may just put up a tent and be out in the open with a good 24 square feet around us that we're able to be uh, 36 square feet around us that, that we're able to, to worship together and be together outdoors with masks, maybe hot, but maybe the outside is what we do for a while. And maybe we do it sporadically. Whatever we do, the important thing to remember is that God has been with God's chosen people for 6,000 years. That's a long time. Actually, that's just the recorded history part of it. 
God has been with humankind since the beginning. Why should we think that God, who establishes the body of Christ, and that we are a part of that body, why should we think that God will let us die? Oh, the organization, sure, at some point it will. But the body of Christ will never die. And we will be given grace upon grace if we are determined to let the body of Christ live in this space, in this region, at this time. No matter what it looks like when we come back, and no matter what it's going to look like, we will always have God to guide us, to show us the way, to keep us together. All we have to do is listen, trust, and hope. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us once again go to God in prayer. God, we are grateful for your willingness and desire to hear us when we come to you with our prayers. So we thank you for the many gifts you have given us and continue to give us. For your continuous presence in our exile, for binding us together in a, in a mutual struggle to help each other remain well, and for inspiring folks of our community with creative ideas of how to safely be together even if it is only by phone or letter or email or social media or even briefly in person. For these and other precious gifts, we lift up our gratitude to you. Christ, great healer and great presence in our hearts, we pray for those who are hurting and in need, for those who are mentally, emotionally, and spiritually broken, for those who are financially broken, for those who are hungry, sick, homeless, and hopeless. Do not ignore them, and do not let us ignore them but help us to bless them with the gifts and the bounty that you have given to us for such a purpose. And further, God, we pray now for those whom we lift before you in love. You alone know their true need, and it is that for which we pray. Now, God, we ask your blessing upon your church in this place. Grant us the strength of faith to be hopeful in this time of exile and not to succumb to fear. Remind us that your Holy Spirit is active, actively in and among us, binding together those of us who are striving to trust in your love. And when our exile is over, send us out to redesign, rebuild, and regenerate your community of faith for the years of discipleship to come. We pray all this in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, 
and the communion of the Holy Spirit be and abide with each and every one of us, now and forevermore. Amen.